Hello, welcome to Mission San Luis. I'm Jerry Lee, and I'm an archaeologist with Florida's Bureau of Archaeological Research, stationed here at the Mission. I hope to offer a series of virtual tours of uh, Mission San Luis, which was a 17th century uh, Spanish mission to the Appalachian Indians. Today, I'd like to focus on the history of Mission San Luis and the town plan of the mission as we understand it. Now, the Appalachians were among the most powerful and numerous of the Indian groups in Florida. At least during the historic period, their homeland was the area between the Osceola and Ocloconee rivers. Probably also extended from the Gulf Coast to somewhere near the uh, Georgia state line. Their prehistoric capital was at the Lake Jackson Mounds Complex. And some of the artifacts from Lake Jackson show that the Appalachians participated in a, a wide-reaching network of trade. Now, the Appalachians were farmers. Uh, they hunted and gathered food in the forest, and they fished in the uh, lakes and streams, but they depended on agriculture for a lot of their subsistence. They grew several different crops, but none was more important than corn. The first European explorers who were recorded as entering Appalachian territory are Panfilo de Narvaez in 1528 and Hernando de Soto in 1539. Now, both of these Spanish expeditions landed on the central Florida Gulf Coast in search of treasure. The Appalachians and their power were well known to the Indians of the uh, Gulf Coast, and they told the explorers that they could find their, the wealth that they sought in Appalachian territory. Now, while the fame of the Appalachian had certainly spread uh, down into that area, uh, I'm sure the Indians along the uh, Florida's Gulf Coast uh, really just wanted the Spanish to leave them alone and move on somewhere else. Now, both Narvaez and De Soto traveled into Appalachian territory and both left accounts of their interactions with the Appalachian. Now, Appalachian warriors resisted both expeditions with great violence. De Soto spent the winter of 1539 to 1540 in one of the Appalachian's principal towns, a village called Enhaika. Now, there were constant raids and attacks on his men while he was at that village. But some of those men recorded that there were large areas of planted fields in Appalachian territory. Now, let's fast forward to the year 1565. That was the year Pedro Menendez de Aviles founded St. Augustine on the Atlantic coast of Florida. It wasn't long before Catholic missions began to be founded among the Tamukuan Indians around that area, and also along Georgia's Atlantic coast among the Wale Indians. First, Jesuit missionaries were employed, but they had uh, limited success, and by 1573, Franciscan miss missionaries had taken their place. And they had better luck in converting the Indians in and around St. Augustine to the Catholic faith. Eventually, missions were also founded west of St. Augustine in the interior territory of the Tamukuans. Now, the Indians of all these missions were depended on to supply food to St. Augustine and as a source of labor. In return for becoming subjects of the Spanish crown, they were required to offer a yearly paid labor tribute. Now, through fits and starts, Franciscan missions were pushed farther west into the Ustaga territory of the Tamukuans. The Ustaga lived just east of the Osceola River and were the traditional enemies of the Appalachian who lived on the other side. The, Franciscan, the Franciscans looked to securing the safety of their Ustaga missions by making a peace between the Ustagas and the Appalachians. In 1608, that peace was formally established by two Franciscan friars at a remarkable conference at Avita Chuco, the Appalachians' capital town near the Osceola River. The two priests and 150 Tamukuan warriors from throughout Tamukua province were met by over 30,000 Appalachians, including the chiefs and, and leaders from 107 Appalachian villages. Now, the Appalachians requested that missions be founded in their towns, and the chief of the Appalachian village of Inahaika 
was chosen to travel to St. Augustine to pledge obedience to the Spanish crown on behalf of all the Appalachians. Now the Franciscans weren't ready to begin, uh, to begin those missions in Appalachia just yet. Friars did visit and spend time in Appalachian villages, but on a couple of occasions they had to withdraw because of concerns for their safety. At least by the 1620s, the Appalachians were occasionally carrying corn to St. Augustine for sale or barter to help feed that city. Now the Spaniards were interested in Appalachian province as a source of food and as a source of labor, especially as the numbers of Indians around St. Augustine and along the Atlantic coast declined in numbers through disease, overwork, or desertion. Since the Appalachians based their subsistence on farming, and because there were simply more of the Appalachian Indians to begin with, they fit the bill for the Spanish in both cases. There are probably a number of reasons the Appalachians were interested in being allied with the Spanish. The Spaniards had already become allies with their traditional enemies, and they may not have wanted to face both Ustaga warriors and the powerful Spaniards. Certainly, the Appalachians were interested in the material goods the Spanish might offer them, iron tools, uh, glass beads, other things. Later on, cloth was a favored item. There was also a loss of faith in the leaders of the Appalachians. One Franciscan friar said that the Appalachians had lost respect for their chiefs and that the chiefs wanted to use the power of the Spaniards to bolster their own standing. Now, the Franciscans began founding missions in Appalachian territory in 1633. So far, very few documents pertaining to the earliest period of missionization have been discovered. We think that the first missions to the Appalachians would have been placed in their most, most important villages. Avita Chuco and Inahaika would both have been among the first missions founded. The first time the name of San Luis was given on a mission list from the 1650s, it was called San Luis de Inahaika. Now this is pretty close to the name of Anhaika, the village where De Soto had overwintered about a century before. And the first mission San Luis was probably located in that Appalachian village. Now in 1639, the port of San Marcos was established near the confluence of the St. Marks and Wakulla rivers. The port allowed for corn and other goods to be sent by water to St. Augustine, but it also served as a way to get the resources of Appalachia and beyond to markets in Cuba and even Mexico without paying taxes on them. The trade between Appalachia and Cuba is responsible for most of the relative wealth that we see at San Luis. A deputy governor was assigned to Appalachia in 1645 as the province assumed more importance to St. Augustine. He was a Florencia, a family that would play a prominent role throughout the mission period in Appalachian province. Unfortunately, Deputy Governor Florencia arrived on the scene not long before he and most of his, most of his family were killed in a rebellion led by some Appalachians and non-Christian Chiska Indians. In the uprising, three friars were also killed and seven of the eight churches in Appalachia at that time were destroyed. Spanish soldiers from St. Augustine and Tamuquan warriors regained control of the Appalachians relatively swiftly. The ringleaders of the rebellion were harshly sentenced and in return for a general amnesty, the Appalachians were, were required to make that yearly labor contribution to the Spaniards, something that they earlier had not been forced to do. The churches and missions were soon reestablished. In 1656, there was a native uprising in Tumukua, and Appalachian warriors assisted the Spanish in putting it down. After the Tumukuan rebellion, the governor in St. Augustine reorganized many of the missions of Tumukua to place them closer to the Camino Real, the royal road extending from St. Augustine to Appalachian province. This suggests the growing importance of Appalachian province, 
The Tamukuan missions became way stations along the road to support the movement of goods and people. That same year of 1656, Mission San Luis was moved from its earlier site a couple of miles to the east to this location. The move was apparently suggested by the Spaniards, but the chief of San Luis agreed to move his village and build a strong house for the deputy governor and his small garrison of soldiers. The chosen site was a broad ridge top of about 200 feet in elevation. Seep springs flowed from the northeastern edge of the hill for a constant supply of fresh water. Although the site had several natural advantages, it doesn't look like there was any significant occupation on the hilltop when the mission was moved. Historic documents tell us that San Luis had a central plaza, a church, a friary on that plaza where the priest lived, a council house, and a large fort. Now, San Luis was not your average mission. In its new location, it was home to a Franciscan friar, the deputy governor and his family, and a small garrison of Spanish soldiers. Now, this small number of Spaniards was still many more than in a typical mission, which usually had only a single Spanish friar. San Luis was either the largest or nearly the largest mission for the entire time it was at its second location. The census from 1675 tells us that San Luis served 1,400 Appalachians, including the inhabitants of three or four nearby satellite villages. San Luis became the capital town of, of Appalachian province. Although the port was available and some goods were moved by water, much of the food for St. Augustine was carried there, a long and arduous journey along the Camino. Closer to home, the Appalachians raised chickens and pigs for sale or barter to the Spaniards and enjoyed some of the benefits of that trade. Things began to change after about 1675. The governor in St. Augustine offered land grants out in the provinces that encouraged some Spaniards to found their own farms and ranches. By the end of the 17th century, there were nine Spanish-owned ranches in Appalachian province. These Spanish enterprises monopolized the agricultural and livestock trade to the detriment of the Appalachians. Now, we don't know how many Spaniards moved into or near San Luis, but it looks like there must have been a considerable number. There's also a name change at that time. After 1675, San Luis is called San Luis de Talimali. Now in a letter written to the Spanish king in 1699, the chief of San Luis complained about the hardships put on him and his people by the Spanish families at his village. He said that his Appalachian villagers had moved away from the mission because the Spaniards were taking over the town. Now, Charlestown had been founded by the English and the Carolinas in 1670, and a long struggle between the English and the Spaniards began. Carolina's governor, James Moore, attempted to expel the Spaniards from Florida in 1702 by destroying the missions along the Atlantic coast and putting St. Augustine to siege. He failed at this because all of the city retreated into the big stone fortress the Castillo de San Marcos, for which a great part of the labor for its construction had been provided by Appalachians. Moore burned most of the town, but the siege was lifted when the Spanish ships from Havana were sighted, and Moore withdrew back to the north. Two years later, Moore attempted to accomplish the same objective by wrecking St. Augustine's support system, the interior Tumucuan and Appalachian missions. By now, the Appalachians had grown weary of Spanish promises of protection. During two English-led or English-influenced raids into Appalachian province in 1704, Spanish and Appalachian forces were defeated. Most of the other Appalachian missions were destroyed during the raids, although Mission San Luis itself was never directly attacked. When rumors of a third raid spread, the Appalachians had had enough and said they would no longer help the Spaniards. As a result of these raids, 
Many Appalachians were captured by the English and taken back to the Carolinas, and others joined them voluntarily to live among the English. Other groups of Appalachians headed east toward St. Augustine or west to Pensacola and points beyond. The Spaniards knew they couldn't hold the area without Appalachian assistance. They burned San Luis and evacuated the entire province. They took with them what they could and buried or destroyed everything else. Although the English had failed again to oust the Spaniards from Florida, they had completely finished off the Appalachian missions. Over the ensuing years, Spaniards visited the old mission sites with plans of repopulating them, but it never happened. The port at San Marcos was reestablished about 15 years later, but it never assumed its former importance when Appalachia served as the breadbasket for St. Augustine. During the American period, the location of the former mission was part of an 800-acre plantation owned by the Randolph family, and they built a big two-story house. Near the end of the 19th century, that home was occupied by Emile Dubois, a French-born vintner who established vineyards at San Luis and around Lake Hall. In the 1930s, about 350 acres were purchased by James Messer, and he demolished the former home to build the brick and limestone Messer House that still stands on the site today. Now, the location of San Luis had never been lost. It's marked on early American period maps as a Spanish fort in town. The Messers were aware that a Spanish community had been located on their property, and they allowed the very first professional archaeology at San Luis in 1948. In that year, John Griffin conducted excavations in the fort of San Luis. His work here, along with that of Hale Smith and Mark Boyd, was included in a book on the Appalachian missions called Here They Once Stood, The Tragic End of the Appalachian Missions. Now, that book included the only map depicting San Luis that we know of. It was drawn in 1705, the year after the abandonment of the province, by a Spanish admiral making a reconnaissance of the area around San Luis. It shows the Church of San Luis, a neatly arranged group of Spanish homes, and the fort. The map doesn't have enough detail to be of much value in determining town plan, other than the fact the homes are all arranged on a grid pattern. It seems to show San Luis as only an idealized Spanish town. Remember, it was drawn the year after the mission had been burned and abandoned. The map has more detail about the fort, even marking the northern seep spring as its water source. A larger scaled inset shows the blockhouse surrounded by a palisade with bastions at each corner and a dry moat. Now in 1983, the remaining 50 acres of the Messer Holdings were purchased by the state of Florida for a long-term program of historical and archaeological research to culminate in recreating some of the mission as an outdoor museum. The first person hired for the project was a historian who began to compile everything he could from the old Spanish documents about Appalachian province in general and San Luis in particular. The first director of archaeology devised a testing program for the site that included a topographic survey, an auger survey, and test excavations based on the results of those surveys. Except for the general location of the fort at the north end of the property, very little was known about the mission's layout beyond the hints contained in those old Spanish records. For the archaeologists, the first item was to set in a grid system so that any point on the site could be located. A surveying company put in physical concrete monuments every 50 meters across the site, and each monument was given a north and east coordinate relative to an imaginary point off to the southwest of the property. This is one of them right here. This monument's coordinates are 350 meters north of and 350 meters east of that imaginary point, and the absolute elevation of the aluminum plate on top is 62.61 meters above sea level. Once this grid was in place, the topographic survey could begin. This survey measured the elevations of small dips and rises over the site. 
there were several important findings. A circular ridge measuring about 125 meters across was recognized at the south end of the property. A flat platform was noted at the southeastern edge of that circular ridge with several depressions around it to the east and south. A northwest to southeast trending cut in the western hillside was clearly evident on the topo maps. The remains of the blockhouse within the military complex were suggested by a slight rise at the north end of the property. Even though the fill brought in for our reconstructions has softened, really obscured some of that topographic evidence of the site, there are places where you can still see parts of that circular ridge, like here behind me. That cut in the hillside is also still very apparent where it's been widened and deepened by erosion. Now the auger survey was conducted by punching small eight inch holes in the ground every 10 meters and recording the kinds of artifacts that came from each auger test hole. One of the most important findings was that the area within that big circular ridge was relatively free of mission period artifacts. In several spots, concentrations of fired clay building rubble, sometimes along with hand wrought nails, indicated the locations of mission structures. There were more imported Spanish ceramics from the auger tests on the eastern side of the site than on the western side. The results of the topographic and auger testing surveys were used to decide where to place eight small two meter test excavation units across the site. Most of the units came down on evidence of mission construction or in a couple of uh, cases, mission period trash deposits. All of the site testing results were put together to develop an idea of the town plan of San Luis. That early conception of town plan has been refined by years of excavations, but it really wasn't very far off the mark. Even though the second location of San Luis wasn't established as a formal Spanish town in the 1650s, it seems to follow some of a set of Spanish rules that prescribe how new towns should be laid out. There are rules about a rectangular plaza with important structures at the plaza's edge, rules about laying out streets and buildings on a grid pattern, and rules about water sources. In the instances where the perceived town plan breaks sharply with the rules, as in the circular rather than rectangular shaped plaza, it may be that Appalachian traditions dictated certain town elements. The Spaniards were always far outnumbered by the Appalachians. They tended to allow the Appalachians to follow their traditional ways unless those ways clashed with religious doctrine. Now let's look at San Luis town plan as we currently understand it. One thing I'll mention first are the trees. There were probably very few trees on the hilltop when the mission was here. You would have had an expansive view from the ridge and looking down, you would see fewer trees then than we see now. This is because a lot of the area would be utilized as fields for growing the corn and other crops that supported San Luis and St. Augustine or were exported to Cuba through the port at San Marcos. You would probably see small Appalachian homesteads scattered here and there around the fields. We think that most of the Appalachians live near their fields away from the mission center, and we know the mission spread far beyond the current state-owned property. If you could look down on San Luis at different times, you might see different towns. While we believe that most of the Appalachians were scattered around near but not at the mission proper, we have found evidence of Appalachian houses on the hilltop, or at least we think they're Appalachian houses. There were probably more Appalachians who lived at the mission center in the first half of the mission's existence. Some of that evidence of earlier Appalachian houses in the mission center is found in and around Spanish structures. This is evidence that Spanish homes and buildings were taking the place of Appalachian homes after the 1680s and the influx of Spanish civilians into San Luis. 
well, back to the town plan. The circular ridge on the south side of the site represents the 17th century town plaza. The idea of a town plaza would have been familiar to both the Appalachies and the Spanish. The Appalachies played a traditional ball game in their town plazas that pitted players from one Appalachie village against a team from another village. It was played in the plaza at San Luis until the late, until the late 1670s when it was supposedly banned. The Spaniards would have utilized the plaza for military drills, for religious processions, and as a marketplace. For both the Spanish and the Appalachian, their most important structures would have been on the plaza's edge. There are documents that suggest the plaza was swept clean on a regular basis, and the ridge appears to have been built up over the years of maintaining the plaza. Excavations across that ridge, south of the church, showed that the highest numbers of artifacts came from the excavation unit at the apex of that ridge. The cut in the western hillside probably represents a trace of the Camino Real, the royal road that extended from San Luis to St. Augustine. It trends in a northwest to southeast direction and would pass just north of the Mission Plaza. Although we can't see it anywhere else, if you follow the tangent beyond the site to the east, it eventually connects with Old St. Augustine Road in Tallahassee's modern streets. Now in the 1820s, a military officer was tasked with laying out a road from St. Augustine to Pensacola in the new American territory of Florida. He tried to follow the trace of the Camino as much as possible for the segment from St. Augustine to Tallahassee. He wrote that he spent two days around San Luis trying to find the old Spanish road, but found it impossible. Remember, the forest would have grown back over the site. The road was obvious once an Indian guide from the Miccosukee town showed him exactly where it was, and the officer said that the road was better preserved near the old missions. The church, which was likely one of the earliest Spanish structures on the plaza, also follows a similar northwest to southeast orientation. The Appalachian's council house was positioned on that flat platform that the topographic survey had identified at the southeast edge of the plaza. The west side of the council house platform was naturally pretty, fat, pretty flat, but the eastern half of it was artificial, built up with clay mined from those depressions just east and south of the building. It was massive and circular, about 120 feet in diameter. This building served as the seat of native government. The chief of San Luis met and conferred with his leading men and Spanish officials here. The council house also served as a lodge for travelers. Festivals and dances were held around its large central fireplace, and some of the rituals associated with the ball game took place in the council house. A little west of the council house and also at the plaza's edge, a circular 65-foot diameter home that had many of the hallmarks of Appalachian construction was uncovered. There is good evidence that this was the home of an Appalachian chief. The religious complex was on the northwest edge of the plaza across from the council house, and the fact that both the church and council house were on the plaza is a good example of accommodation between the two cultures. The mission church and the friary where the priest lived both fronted onto the plaza. A third structure, the mission kitchen, was behind the friary and connected to it by a covered walkway. All of the buildings in the religious complex follow the orientation of the assumed trace of the Camino Real. I mentioned that more Spanish ceramics were recorded on the east side of the site than on the west during the auger testing. The area east of the plaza was suggested as part of a Spanish village. We've done a lot of field work in various locations on the east side of the site and have located several Spanish residences. They weren't all oriented at exactly the same angle, but all had a northwest to southeast direction on their long axes, except for one which was perpendicular to that orientation. 
Most of the Spanish homes date to after the influx of Spanish civilians into the site after 1675, so it appears that by then at least, a gridded town plan was in place, a plan that was generally followed for new construction. Most of the Spanish houses were of wattle and daub construction, clay plastered over a wooden framework. When a daub structure burned, as all the buildings did in 1704, the clay was fired hard, and concentrations of daub and burned clay in the auger testing suggested where some of these buildings were located. The area west of the plaza was originally proposed as the location of the Appalachian portion of the town. There was plenty of pottery recorded on the west side of the plaza during the auger survey, but fewer imported Spanish ceramics. We conducted pretty extensive excavations west of the plaza, but did not find clear evidence of Appalachian structures. We did find a lot of mission era features, deep pits that were dug for clay for wattle and daub structures, a small pit that was used for cooking, and scattered post molds here and there. One idea for the re region west of the plaza was that it was a native service area where Appalachians worked on various projects to further the aims of the mission. Of course, Appalachian houses could still be over there. Our excavations may have just missed them. Spanish structures, most of daub with wrought nails, are easier to see in the auger survey results. The Appalachian structures, which generally didn't use clay construction or iron nails, are just harder to find. Now, one of those rules for Spanish towns in the New World stipulated that towns should be near a source of good water. Unlike some Spanish colonial sites, St. Augustine, for example, we've never found evidence of a well at San Luis. The seep springs flowing out of the ravine served as the water source for the mission, and they were also utilized by some of the post-mission occupants of the ridge top. They're constantly flowing. I've never seen them dry up. Once the water reaches the base of the ravine, it drains back into the ground. There must have been some improvements made during the mission period to allow for the collection of a lot of water from these shallow flowing streams. The later residents of San Luis install cisterns, and the Apalachis must have done something similar. That officer looking for the Royal Road in the 1820s also checked out the springs. He said he opened one of the springs and found a wooden box or trunk that served to collect the water. I can imagine the Appalachians making countless trips into the ravine to dip water channeled into something like that box. The military complex was situated at the north end of the site. It was constructed as far north of the plaza as possible while still having easy access to the northernmost seep spring. There was often friction between the soldiers and the friars since the friars felt that the garrison members didn't set the best example for the Appalachians. The friars were probably happy to have them off to the north, away from the plaza. When the remaining portion of San Luis was obtained by the state in the early 1980s, it was just good fortune that the core of the mission was preserved in that purchase. At that time, there were still some broad areas around the site that had not been developed. As many of those areas have given way to apartment complexes and retail developments, it makes me even more appreciative for the vision of the people who were behind the initiative to acquire and interpret the mission.